You know, I've never really paid for any Microsoft products. Well, I guess I did have an Xbox 360 and Xbox Live subscription that I paid for over 10 years ago, but I've never actually paid for Windows. And outside of my Xbox 360 days, I've never even given Microsoft a dime. And I bet that's also true for a lot of you Linux users out there that watch my channel. Well, guess what? If you are a tax-paying citizen that is living in the United States of America, or if you pay taxes to the United States of America, your tax dollars are about to go towards helping the government clean up Microsoft's mess. Now, what I'm talking about is the Fed's effort to clean up the Microsoft Exchange servers that have been getting hacked countless times since the beginning of this year. Now, if you're not familiar with Microsoft Exchange and you don't have any idea what that's about, basically, these are mail servers and they're also used for syncing calendars. Uh, they're developed by Microsoft and they run exclusively on the Microsoft server operating system. And this is where the problem lies. You see, Microsoft really does not make a decent uh, server operating system. I mean, really, they don't make a decent operating system at all. And mind you, this isn't just my Linux evangelism kicking in with respect to the server side of things, okay? Um, any IT person, any systems administrator that knows what they're talking about is going to tell you, yeah, you should use some kind of Nix-based OS like BSD or whatever, unless you absolutely need to run Windows to run some type of legacy app. Uh, the company that I work for, we have thousands of call servers all over the world. They all run Linux. If you're on a random website somewhere out there and you're able to fingerprint it, like if they have an error page that um, you know, doesn't redirect to some generic oopsie doopsie error page and it actually gives you some information about what's running on the back end, chances are it's going to be running Linux. Um, you know, the Windows Server operating systems, they're pretty much an afterthought of the Microsoft desktop OSs. In fact, Microsoft didn't even make an OS with server in the name until around 2003. And a server OS, it has much stricter security requirements than a desktop OS, okay? Basically, you don't want that server to do anything, to be able to do anything besides run a handful of apps that you need it to run. And I'm not talking about as far as hardware requirements go. You know, for a server, you want it to be as strong and beefy as possible, but I'm talking about the software uh, that it's going to have on it. Do you want the software to be very, very minimum? Okay, so now we could take a look at this VM uh, that I have here. This is running Windows Server 2019. So this is pretty much the latest and greatest. Uh, and then if we just go into my start menu here, you can see all of this nonsense, okay? So Microsoft Excel, uh, PowerPoint, Publisher, none of this should really be on a server OS, okay? We go, if we go into Windows Accessories, Calculator, like really, what do I need that for? Paint, why would I need Paint if I'm running Microsoft Server 2019? This doesn't make any sense. Now, um, luckily the, um, the uh, bloat of Windows Server isn't as bad as Windows 10, right? Like if we see it's uh, basically idling plus has paint open uh, at 1.2 gigs of RAM. So not as bad as Windows 10. I mean, granted the sound service isn't running uh, and there's quite a few ser quite a few other services in general running uh, compared to Windows on the desktop. But still, this is too much for a server. Even the fact that it has a GUI is, is kind of nonsensical, especially if you're going to be managing this over an SSH connection. But you get the point. Microsoft Windows is just downright goofy as a server OS. Uh, so now let's get into the specifics of this exchange vulnerability uh, that the FBI and other agencies have had to step in and try to help Microsoft out with. Uh, basically, there's several steps to this procedure too. First, they're trying to eliminate uh, any of these backdoors that are on the systems and then Microsoft has to go in and patch them and then they got to try and figure out, okay, what damage was caused onto these systems? Because like I said, they've been exploited for months and months. Uh, they've been playing whack-a-mole with exchange vulnerabilities and hacker groups since the start of this year. So the cleanup of any damage that has already been done to them and making sure that 
you know, any residual stuff from the hackers is fully out. That's probably going to be the tricky part. Um, so we're going to look at some of these CVEs. These are all going to be uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities. The first one that we have here is going to be rated an 8.8 .8 out of 10 uh, rating. And the only reason that it's this low because the other ones are higher is because it requires some privileges to work. Uh, but these other two, they require no privileges at all, which is why they both have a 9.8 out of 10 rating. Now, another thing that's worrying about these vulnerabilities, and this is gonna be true for all three of them, is the fact that the attack vector is going to be done over the network, or the network is gonna be uh, the attack vector, really. So this is a server OS, which means that other computers are going to be connecting to it. And if a company is using Exchange servers for mail and calendars and all that good stuff, you can pretty much guarantee that their employees are going to be using Windows on their laptops and desktops or whatever to uh, connect to these Exchange services. So a worm could be designed to take advantage of these vulnerabilities and then infect all of the other systems that are connecting to it, especially if there's gonna be other exchange servers uh, that are connecting to one another, it's gonna be very easy to get them as well uh, with a worm that's just going to send itself, copies of itself over uh, to all of the different network connections. So how do you actually go about mitigating this, right? Obviously, big deal, you know, two, uh, 9.8 out of 10s and then an 8.8 out of 10. There's several other ones that are uh, much lower, but I think it was like 16 critical CVEs and then 114 in total, something like that. Uh, so yeah, let's get to the mitigations. Uh, there have been patches that have been released for this by Microsoft earlier this week. Uh, so those do exist. Uh, hopefully you've gone ahead and installed them already since they have been out for a couple of days now, especially if you have an exchange server that's being used in production. Uh, now, as far as the actual steps to do it, it's gonna be a little bit different depending on uh, what version of exchange you're using. Cause I don't know if I showed you guys this, but this, is basically a vulnerability for all of the different versions of Exchange. Uh, but you can go to this site here where you just put in your version um, and the current CU that you're on and then tell you the steps and bam, there you go. Uh, there's several steps that you have to go through to do it. Um, mostly you gotta make sure that .NET Framework is up to date. That's gonna be true for pretty much all of them regardless of which version of Exchange you're using. Uh, so yeah, that's what you can do to try and mitigate this problem, or at least that's one thing that you can do to try and mitigate this problem. Uh, of course, if you're going to continue using Microsoft Windows, especially for server applications, then you have to accept that this is going to happen again. It might not be as severe. Uh, it very well could be. It could be more severe, right? <laughs> it's a 10 scale, so it could go 0.2 uh, higher. Um, but yeah, you're going to be patching new vulnerabilities that get found. That's gonna be part of any operating system, especially Windows. But what might be a good idea as a long-term solution uh, so that you don't have to patch things as often would be to move your Exchange workload to a Linux server running open source software. Uh, it'll be a little bit tricky and a lot of testing is obviously gonna have to be done before you can deploy it to production. You gotta make sure everything works. Uh, but here's a few alternatives that you could be using. So we've got Citadel, which provides email, calendaring, scheduling, a web interface, uh, mailing lists, address books, LDAP authentication, and quite a lot more. It's focused on standard protocols. So you've got your SMTP, IMAP, POP3, nothing weird or out of the ordinary that you're gonna have to learn. And it offers just about all of the features that a small or medium-sized business would want. And there's also no enterprise version uh, with a huge markup and licensing that you have to pay for. It's all GPL version three. Colab is another groupware project that integrates several other open source programs like Postfix, OpenLDAP, uh, Cyrus IMAP, Apache, uh, Webmail, and ClamAV. It also plays nice with Contact and Thunderbird, which are open source mail clients. But there is also software that can be used to sort of connect Colab to Microsoft Outlook if you need to do that. 
Uh, and then there is Open Exchange, which can also be used as an alternative to Microsoft Exchange and SharePoint. And it's got email, webmail, calendaring, task management, document management, and much more. So there you go. Here are open source alternatives to more Microsoft crapware. You should look into them. Otherwise, hackers might be looking into you.